Good morning to all of you. Let's begin our session on cryptography, network security, and cyber law. Today it is a continuation of mod module 3, wherein uh, it is a seventh session on key management, authentication, IP security, and security at transport layer. Now, in this session, we will be discussing uh, about authentication using Kerberos. Kerberos, and also we will see what is meant by biometric authentication and what are the various preliminaries involved in it and various uh, um, features that contribute to the biometric authentication. Now, before uh, we get on, let us see what are the objectives of today's session. Now, after attending this session, you shall be able to describe Kerberos authentication protocol and also you will be able to explain biometrics and error measures. Now, let's try to understand what is meant by a password-based system and what are the features required by a password-based system. Now, this password-based system, let's take a simple scenario over here wherein uh, we'll consider this uh, entire scenario to be occurring in VTU campus. And let's say there are multiple, user, multiple users in VTU campus and there are multiple servers catering to the requests of these users in the campus. Now, let's consider this scenario. Le we have considered just one user over here out of multiple users and few of the servers are depicted here. This user, once logged in, may wish to access multiple resources present on various servers. Now over here there are three servers which the user is wishing to access but he has just logged in once. Now what is the possibility of a person to access these particular service servers with just or by just logging in once? Now one possibility is for the user to have multiple password. So the user one can use a password for accessing, let's say password P1 for accessing email server and uh, P2 for accessing the web server and P3 for accessing the file server. Now, as a user, we do not uh, ha have the tendency of remembering multiple passwords. If there are 10 servers or 20 servers existing within this particular uh, uh, organization, in that case, having a separate password for each of these servers is really uh, cumbersome and remembering them is even more uh, difficult. Now, there should be some way out in which the user is able to ease his life. Now, what, what is the other possibility? Now, the other possibility in case of password-based system is that the user uses one password in order to access various other servers present in the organization. Now, what is the difficulty here? User is just using one password to access every um, other server. User's, user's uh, life is made easy. But what is the difficulty at the other end, wherein there are multiple servers? All these servers need to maintain a file which will contain the passwords of the user. And the, this file has to be shared across all the users, all the servers, sorry. All the servers need to have this particular password file. Maintaining and distributing such a file which contains password of various users is difficult at the other end. Now let's see further what are the needs of a password based system. Now whenever uh, we provide password to our system uh, password, this password should not be transmitted in clear. Now, what happens if a password is transmitted in clear? An attacker could gain access if passwords are transmitted in clear. So, we avoid it. Now, what is the second uh, requirement for a password-based system? It should not be possible to launch dictionary attacks. Now, what now, the attacker should not be able to uh, eavesdrop, on the uh, eavesdrop on the passwords that are shared with the other end and he should not be able to uh, store those or guess those and uh, launch a dictionary attack. Now, the third requirement for a password-based system is that 
whenever we are storing a password on an authentication server these passwords should not be stored in clear that means they should be transformed into something else encrypted and then stored so that we are able to avoid the dictionary attacks now the fourth requirement is the user it, it should not be possible to launch dictionary attacks by obtaining the file containing cryptographically transform, transformed versions of the password. Now even if the attacker is able to get the access to this cryptographically transformed uh, uh, passwords file, even in that case he should not be able to launch a dictionary attack. Now, over here, the fifth requirement of a password-based system is that the user enter his passwords only once during the login. And then he can have access to the resources until he logs out. He need not re-enter the password and again and again when using different resources or multiple resources. Now, le let us take an example of Outlook. Outlook provides access to email, access to drives. It also allows uh, creation of uh, online documents, online forms, online Excel sheets. Now, when we shift from an email to say like we are storing something on a drive, now when, when trying to use this particular drive, we, we do not uh, log in again into the system. Right? Now, even if we want to compose a file, a Word file, uh, online using Outlook, even in that case, we do not log in again. Once logged in, we are allowed to use, uh, we are allowed to access entire set of resources that are available under that particular application. Now, this is the requirement of a password-based system. Now, let's look at the sixth requirement. The password entered by the uh, user during the logging time uh, it should reside in the machine for ve very less duration of time. It should not be uh, stored on the system and it should not stay on the system for a, a, hu a longer duration of time because there could be an attacker who will be, uh, who may compromise the system and get the password. Hence, the password should reside on this particular machine for a very less duration of time. Now, having understood the various requirements of a password-based system and how a password-based system should work, what are the possibilities associated with this password-based system, let us see if Kerberos is able to cater to this particular need. Now, Kerberos is an authentication protocol which was developed, developed at MIT and it has various versions which were proposed. The latest version is the Kerberos version 5. Now, where is this Kerberos used? The Kerberos uh, is used in Windows operating system including Vista and also Microsoft Server 2008. Now, this Kerberos protocol obviously derives certain features from Needham Schroeder protocol which we discussed in the previous session. Now, what are those ingredients of the Needham Schroeder protocol that Kerberos has adopted? First is, Kerberos also makes use of a key distribution center referred to as KDC. Now, this is also called as trusted third party and this is used to provide authentication between two communicating parties. Now, this algorithm of the Needham Schroeder protocol is split into two logical entities. Now, the, now, one of the entity is called as authentication server referred to as AH and the other entity is called as the ticket granting server referred to as the ticket granting, uh, sorry, TGS. Now, look, look at the third point. Now, similar to that of the Needham Schroeder protocol, the ticket is used in case of Kerberos also. Now, why do we use the ticket? Ticket is a safe mechanism to distribute a session key among two communicating parties. Now, what are the other things that Kerberos uses? Now, user A, let's say there are two users who are wishing to authenticate to each other. What does user A do? User A shares a secret key with the authentication server. And this secret key is called as KA. KA 
is the key that is shared between the authentication server and the user A. And how do we obtain this particular KA? KA is obtained by hashing the user A's password. Similarly, user B shares a secret key with the ticket granting server and this key is called as KB. Now, if you remember the Needham-Schroeder protocol, which makes it makes use of nonces. Over here in the Kerberos, it uses nonces along with the timestamp. Now, what is the purpose of using a nonce and a timestamp? The nonce and the timestamp help avoid a replay attack. Now, let's start with the actual Kerberos with this particular background. The key distribution center authenticating a user will record the logging time and also the maximum duration for which the particular session will run and the session key. The, no, the logged in users request for the service. Now what are the service that uh, the logged in user requests? The KDC creates the tickets for the user and the requested server. Now the ticket contains the encrypted session key and also other information like the lifetime of the session key. That is the duration for which the session key will be uh, usable or valid. The session key is then further used to encrypt the subsequent messages that are uh, communicated between the user and the requested server. Now over here we can see that key distribution center is used for authenticating the server. And uh, now how does the user get authenticated itself to the server? Key distribution center keeps track of all these details and also the users once they are logged in they can request for a service. Now this is the way the services can be uh, requested. We will get into the depth of it. Now over here we have a sequence of messages uh, that are exchanged between the client, the Kerberos server and also the requested server. Now remember that the client is interested to take services from this particular server S. But before it seeks services from the server server S, it has to authenticate itself with that of the authentication server and, the, uh, and seek ticket from the ticket granting server in order to access the uh, required server. Now, as we are aware that authentication server and the ticket granting server both together form the Kerberos server or the Kerberos authentication server. Now remember there are there are almost four entities that are involved over here client being on one side and the three servers being on the other side. Now there are three steps that are involved. Now client first communicates with the authentication server and then client communicates with the ticket granting server and further uh, after authentication the client starts communicating with the server for mutual authentication. Now the number of messages exchanged by the client with that of the authentication server is 2 and also with the ticket granting server is 2 and the requested server is 2. So totally 6 messages are exchanged in, two, uh, in 3 steps uh, of communication. Now let's have a look at this diagram. Over here we can see that the user logs on to a work station and request for a service on host. Now this is the user who wants to communicate with this particular server. Now in order to communicate with this server the user has to go uh, has to authenticate itself and prove its genuinity with the Kerberos authentication protocol. Now over here we can see that the Kerberos authentication protocol is having uh, logically two entities. One is the authentication server and the other one is the ticket granting server. Now let's see the user once he logs in and requests for a service on the host. Now this request is transmitted to the Kerberos. Now over here we have seen that the user requests for a ticket granting ticket that is it requests for a ticket granting ticket from the TGS. Now the authentication server verifies the user's access rights in the database, creates a ticket granting ticket and also a session key and results 
are encrypted using the key that is derived from the user's password. Okay. Now, what is happening here? A ticket granting ticket is generated if this user is found to be valid and then along with that a session key is generated. Now these uh, the user uh, the ticket granting ticket and the session key both are encrypted using the user's password using the key derives from, uh, derived from the user's password. Now this is a key that is shared between the user and the authentication server. Now the user is able to receive the ticket along with the session key obviously this is uh, returned in an encrypted form as already discussed once it reaches the user what does the user do now the workstation prompts the user for password and uses the password to decrypt the incoming message now this message which is received will be decrypted and then sends the ticket and authenticator that contains username network address and the time to TGS. Now all these details are sent to the ticket granting ticket requesting for a service granting ticket. Now service granting ticket is a ticket which will be which will allow the host or the user to communicate with the server. Now what does the ticket granting server do on a request from the user for a service granting ticket? Now the TGS decrypts the ticket and authenticator which it received in message number 3 verifies the request and then creates a ticket for the requested server if the request is valid and then sends this ticket along with the session key to the user at the other end now what does the user do the the workstation sends the ticket and authenticator to the server so it will ask the server to uh, provide it with a service. Now the server receives this particular service uh, request from the user which is coming in the message number 5. The server verifies the ticket and the authenticator match. And if they match it grants the access to the service. If mutual authentication is required, server returns the authenticator. So if the server has to authenticate itself to the user in that case what does the server do? The server returns the authenticator to the user. The user can use that and verify the genuinity of the server. Now over here we can see that the communication that occurs between the user and the authentication server it occurs just once per user login session. Okay, Once the user is having access to this system he need not uh, again and again authenticate himself to the authentication server. Now over here the communication between the user and the ticket granting uh, uh, server is of this type wherein this communication occurs once per type of service. What does this mean? Now once the system is um, authenticated let's say this is a G, uh, this is a outlook or a gmail server to which let's take a gmail server example it is authenticated to gmail now if i want to access something else uh, within that particular gmail uh, like i may have to provide let's say i want to change the password i need to authenticate myself just once again if i have to use some other service even in that case I authenticate once again. Now over here the user is logged in once to the system and then for another uh, login uh, in order to request for a, serv a service which is provided by the ticket granting server what does it do? The user ac uh, try tries to request for a service granting ticket from the ticket granting server. Now one request for this particular server, if there is another server, another request, another third server, another request and every time a new server pops up or a different server if the user wants to communicate, he has to only communicate with the ticket granting server and no communication is required with the authentication server since it is already logged in successfully. Now over here we can see that the user and the server will be uh, exchanging these messages once per service session. I, I want a service at that time 
I authenticate myself to this server with the help of the ticket granting server and then once I'm done with this I just log out of this particular uh, service or the server and move on to the next server so remember when user communicates with the authentication server it's one per uh, login session and with the ticket granting server it's once per type of service and with uh, the server it is once per uh, service session now let's have a look at the various keys used in Kerberos. now KC is the long-term key of the client now this key is derived from the user's password and it is known only to the uh, client and the key distribution center particularly over here it is authentication server KTGS is the long-term key of TGS it is known to KDC and the ticket granting service now KS is the long-term key of the network service S or the server S it is known to the server and the ticket granting service or the server separate key for each service and KCTGS is a short, a short term key between the client and the ticket granting server which is created by the KDC known only to the client and the TGS now we have KCS is a short term key which is used between the client and the server it is created by TGS and it is known only to the client and the server now these are the various symmetric keys that will be used in Kerberos Now let's have a look at this uh, particular diagram. We have again a uh, simplified version of the previous diagram. We have client, we have the Kerberos uh, authentication server and we have the server with which the client intends to communicate. Now within the Kerberos server we, ca we can see that there are two, ser uh, two servers involved. One is the authentication server and the other one is the ticket granting server. Now the first two messages that is M1 and M2 are in are exchanged between the client and the authentication server now over here in case of m1 c requests for a ticket granting ticket and m2 uh, c receives the ticket granting ticket that is it can access the ticket granting server now in case of m3 and m4 these are the two messages exchanged between the client and the ticket granting ticket now what happens in case of m3 is c requests for a service granting ticket from TGS now this service granting ticket is a ticket that client needs to access the server now M4, uh, in M4 the, uh, the ticket granting server sends the ticket granting uh, ticket along with the session key to the client now let's have a look at the last two messages that are exchanged between the client and the actual server with which the client in intends to communicate which is uh, uh, is, uh, depicted with M5 and M6 in case of the message M5 C authenticates itself to the server and in case of M6 which is coming from the server to the client the server authenticates itself to the client now let's see what are the various ingredients of these messages now over here we can see that the client is sending a message to the authentication server I have divided all the messages according to their communication the first two messages are intended to the authentication server next two to the ticket granting ticket uh, sorry ticket granting server and the third one is to the actual uh, server or the requested server now over here the authentication service exchange in order to obtain a ticket granting ticket access from TGS now over here client is sending a message to authentication server now what does this message contain it contains the identity of the client the identity of the ticket granting server the time and also the nonce R1 which is generated by the client C upon receiving this particular message the authentication server has to provide a response to the client now in the second message authentication server is sending a response to the client and this response contains the ID of the client for which this response is intended to and the ticket to access the TGS and also uh, the session key KCTGS and the ID of TGS the times and the nonce R1 now all of this is encrypted using EC EC is a key uh, EC encrypted using KC KC is a key that is shared between the client and the authentication server and this key is derived from client's password
all right now where over here let's see what we mean by ticket tgs okay over here we can see it is a session key the id of the client the time times uh, which are provided or the timestamp which is provided along with that the id of tgs all of these are encrypted using the ktgs now we know that ktgs is the key you can just have a look over here ktgs is the key that is shared between the authentication server and the ticket granting server Now moving further, once client has obtained the uh, ticket, it can now communicate with the ticket granting server. Now the, these two messages, 3 and 4, we refer to them as ticket granting service exchange in order to obtain the service granting ticket. Now the client sends a message to the ticket granting server wherein it specifies the server's ID with which it wants to communicate and the time or, or the duration of the session, the ticket TGS, the authenticator C and also a new nonce is generated R2. Where authenticator C is, includes the ID of the client and the timestamp 1. Now both of these uh, parameters are encrypted using the key which is shared between the client and the TGS. Now, the ticket granting server in response to the message 3 generates a ticket to access the server S and also it provides a session key KCB. Now, let us look at this particular message. Now, ID of the client is included, the ticket to the server is included and also we have the ID of the server the uh, session key which will be exchanged uh, or which will be used by the client and the server, the time or the duration of the session and also R2 is the nonce. All of this is encrypted using the key KCTGS. Now KCTGS is the key that is shared by between the client and the ticket granting server. Now what does this ticket S contain? Now this ticket S contains the ID of the client, the uh, session key which is exchanged between the client and the server and the times also. All of this is encrypted using this uh, session key that is, sh uh, sorry, it is en encrypted using the key that is shared uh, with that of the server. ES is a key, or KS is a key that is shared between the server and the ticket granting server. Now once uh, the client has obtained uh, a ticket to access the server and also a session key to communicate with that of the server, this should be KCS, S instead of V. Now once the uh, client has obtained these two, it can further communicate with the server and obtain the service. Now first client sends a message to S. It will send to, uh, uh, the ticket to the server and also it will send the authenticator. Now the authenticator contains the client's details along with that it contains the timestamp 2 both of which are encrypted using the key that is shared between the client and the server S. Now the server in response will send its uh, details for further authentication by the client and uh, this message contains the timestamp 2 which is incremented by 1. This time, time, uh, timestamp 2 was received from the client in the previous message, that is message number 5. Now these, this uh, timestamp is encrypted using the key that is shared between the client and the server. Now over here remember the first two messages are uh, used or are, are exchanged between the client and the authentication server and the client performs this operation only once for the entire login session. Now if in case if it wants to uh, access a server 1, the client communicates with the ticket granting uh, uh, server to give it a ticket in order to access to the server 1. Now for every server that client, uh, it, uh, the client wants to communicate, it has to request the ticket granting server for the ticket to communicate with that particular server. 
Now, this is this uh, the number of com uh, this communication between the client and the ticket granting uh, server depends upon the number of services the client wishes to access. The third communication, uh, where which contains message five and six, is usually used between the client and the server to mutually authenticate with each other before obtaining a service from the server. Now, this is exactly what happens in a Kerberos protocol. Now, the short term key, session key over here uh, are the session keys and the long term secrets are used only to derive these short term secrets or these are short term keys. Separate session key is used for every client and server pair, but multiple user server sessions reuse the same key. Now, the proofs of identity over here, uh, be it of the client or the server or the ticket granting server, is provided with the help of authenticators. Client encrypts uh, his birthday address current time using a short term session key, which will help prevent the replay attack. The server learns this key separately and verifies user's identity. Now, over here we can see that there is lot of symmetry key cryptography that is involved because lot of keys are shared secrets. Now, what are the uh, practical uses of Kerberos? Kerberos is used in email application, FTP, uh, network file systems and many other applications which have to be Kerberized. Use of Kerberos is transparent to the end user. They are not aware that there is a Kerberos protocol running, running underneath. Transparency is important for usability. Now, local authentication also makes use of Kerberos, wherein we use, uh, uh, we log in and uh, uh, sue in uh, case of open BSD. Authentication uh, can also be provided by Kerberos for network protocols. Uh, which includes R login, uh, R shell and telnet. Now, let us move to the second half uh, of this particular session that is use of biometrics in order to authenticate a uh, person or a user. A biometric is a biological feature or a characteristic of a person which will uniquely identify him over a lifetime. The common features that include for biometric identification are the face recognition that we are la using latest uh, in our latest telephones or the mobile handsets and the voice recognition, manual signatures and fingerprints. And even the patterns of your iris and the DNA can be used for biometric authentication, as biometrics for authentication. Now, recent addition to this biometrics includes keystroke dynamics and also the trait uh, of a person's walk. The way in which a person walks is also suggested to be a biometric identification. Now, generally, uh, how do we recognize that so and so is a person? Now, like we see the traits of that particular person in order to recognize uh, it is X, right? Now, biometric form forms were first proposed and an alternative or a complement to password. Now, passwords are based on what a user know, whereas biometrics are based on what a person has. Now, Biometric links the identity of a person to his physiological or behavioral characteristics. There are no, two main processes that are involved in a biometric system. Now, we all use biometric system in order to log in ourselves to our uh, university or wherever. Now, what does those, first you need to enroll over there and every day it will, the system keeps on recognizing you. Now, what do we mean by this enrollment? In this phase, the subject's biometric sample is acquired. Let me say we have a biometric in our organization and before we start using this particular system, we have to enroll ourselves. Now, let's say it takes our fingerprint, thumbprints. Now, I need to give samples even before I start using it. Now, I may give some five samples or three samples so that the system is able to recognize even if I give in a different angle. 
So over here biometric subject, uh, subject's biometric sample is acquired, that process is over and then the essential features of the sample are extracted to create a reference template. Now uh, with my particular name, a template is created and uh, uh, stored in the database so that they are used for further matching when I uh, try to log in every day. Now sometimes multiple samples are taken and multiple templates are stored to increase the accuracy of the match in subsequent recognition phase. Now biometric recognition system. Now the fresh biometric sample of a person is taken and then it is compared to the reference templates to determine the extent of the of the match. If there is a match then you are allowed to access the system. If there is, a, if there is no match you may be asked for re-entering your uh, uh, thumb, the thumbprint or whatever biometric with which you have logged in. Now biometrics are used in two different scenarios. One is for authentication of a, uh, of a user to the system or it is used for identification of an user to a system. Now authentication refers to biometric system stores the login name and the biometric sample. It is a one on one match or one to one match. Whereas identification is, is wherein a biometric sample of the subject is taken but the subject's identity is not presumed to be known beforehand. It is assumed that a database of biometric samples of several users already exists and you are trying to identify from that particular database. Now in identification, the subject's biometric sample is compared with the samples in the database to determine if the match exists with any one of them. Identification involves one to many match over here. In case of authentication, it is one to one match. A typical application of authentication is in access control while identification finds widespread use, of forensic, use in forensic and criminology. Now what are the characteristics of a good biometric system? One is universality, second is uniqueness and third one is permanence. Let's see what we mean by universality. Universality is wherein all human beings should be able to contribute a sample of the biometric. For example, the speech impaired may not be able to contribute towards voice recognition system. What is uniqueness? Now biological samples taken from two different humans should be sufficiently different that they can be distinguished by machine intelligence. One litmus test of uniqueness is whether the biometric samples of two identical twins serves to unambiguously identify them. Now it is very difficult when we try to identify identical twins or when we try to authenticate identical twins. Now there should be some way out in order to differentiate them. Now what do we mean by permanence? Permanence is that the biometric which we have provided as in a sample should not change over time. The samples that are acquired during the enrollment may be several years old, even after 10-20 years, those samples should be still valid. Now it should be possible to detect a match between the newly acquired sample and that stored in the database of samples of thousands of individuals. For example, a person's voice may temporarily change due to cold. Now another um, biometric that is uh, most commonly used is the fingerprint. Fingerprint is an expression left by the ridges and the valleys of a human finger. Each individual fingerprint exhibits distinctive patterns. During the enrollment and the recognition phase, an image of the fingertip is taken by placing it on a plain surface of the scanner. We are all aware of this because this fingerprint is used nowadays in logging into your mobile system. During the recognition phase, the input template must match with the patterns stored already in the database. 
Now the simplest approach involves identification of distinctive patterns formed by the ridges. These are called as singularities. Now what are the other things that are present in the fingerprint? There is an arc, there is a loop, there is a whorl. Now what does arc refer to? Arc is the ridge that fa starts from the side, uh, one side of the finger and forms an arc and ends on the other side. Now when you observe your fingertip, you can see these arcs and the loops and the whorls. Now what is the loop? The loop is a ridge that starts and ends at the same side of the finger. And whorls appear to be closed cycles or spirals on the fingerprints. Now all these uh, parameters or all these uh, arcs, loops, ridges and whorls contribute to the uniqueness of the fingerprint. Now another important biometric that is used frequently is the iris scan. When we, uh, when we log into our laptop, usually we have seen that there is a biometric authentication that occurs with the system. The user has to provide his eyes, uh, his the picture of the eye, or he has to, uh, like uh, the webcam will capture his uh, eyes in order to authenticate him to the system. Now what does this contain, iris contain? The iris is a thin opaque diaphragm of smooth muscle situated in front of the lens of the human eye. Its annular shape surrounds the pupil. The intricate patterns of the iris appears to be unique. Two, two identical twins have iris patterns uh, that are different as those of two unrelated individuals. Now remember, we always wanted to differentiate the twins uh, who have almost all patterns to be similar, identical twins who have uh, all patterns to be similar. Now, iris, is one, uh, iris uh, authentication is one good way of differentiating them. Now, the patterns of an iris are also stable with age. They do not change with age. Now, this marks the end of the session, wherein we have discussed about Kerber. First, we started our discussion with pass password-based system. What is a password-based system and what are the features required for a password-based system? Then moving further, we started, uh, we have discussed about Kerberos, the various steps involved in authenticating a client to, to a server and, uh, and the number of messages that are exchanged and uh, how many times a user has to log in and all that we have discussed in case of Kerberos and how it is able to cater to the requirements of password based systems also we have seen. Then we have moved on with our discussion on biometrics and the various uh, uh, biometric uh, parameters and uh, uh, physiological parameters that contribute to the biometric authentication. Now let's uh, conclude the session with uh, uh, these uh, ideas of Kerberos and biometric authentication and also if you have any queries you can revert back on this email or over this contact number. Thank you. Have a great day.